Well, we're going to look a little different today, but Romans, we're going to start. I'd like us to start studying through the book of Romans. But today we'll we're going to look at the life of the Apostle Paul before and up to his conversion, Lord willing. Mm-hmm. Romans 1. In verse 1 starts out with Paul, the servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated under the gospel of God. Amen. Now, regarding Paul, we know he was once called Saul. They wrote 13 and possibly 14 books of the New Testament. Most people think that he wrote this book of Romans around AD 57. Well, it was very likely that this church or some group in this church is would later on defect and give into the heresies that become the Catholic Church. Right. But for today, I'd like us to just look at Paul, the writer of this epistle. We go back to Acts chapter seven. We'll probably not cover anything that we haven't seen before, but. Acts chapter 7, we first see the appearance of Paul, who was called Saul. <coughs> we can pick up in verse 54, if you're familiar with this, Stephen had been preaching, and the, the Jews there were not liking what he had to say. He was just simply preaching the truth, and it was convicting them, if you will, or bothering their conscience, I guess. Right. In verse 54, it says, When they heard these things, or what Stephen had been preaching, so they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, speaking of Stephen, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven, and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing on the right hand of God, and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened. And the Son of Man is standing on the right hand of God. And they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord. Mm-hmm. And cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. Amen. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not the singular charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. So here we see the stoning of Stephen, and Saul or Paul was there as a witness. Then they laid down their clothes at his feet. He was the the coat holder, if you will, right, for those who would kill Stephen. You know, they couldn't get their clothes dirty, so they had to take them off and give them to Saul to hold. Right. This was about having a lasting effect on the Apostle Paul, this testimony that Stephen bore out before him. As far as we know, there he was never directly preached the gospel there in this instance. We don't see him attending services where Peter was preaching or right. any of the others. But here we, he sees the witness of Stephen and he goes on in chapter 8 from just being the the helper at the persecutions to being the persecutor himself. Romans chapter 8, first three verses saying, Saul was consenting unto his death. He was in agreement with the death of Stephen. It says, and at that time there was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad through the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. And the devout man carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. In those verse 3, As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house, and hailing men and women, committing them to prison. Right. Ooh. Paul had went about from church to church, from house to house, it says, and persecuting them, picking them, putting them in prison doing what he thought was the service of God. Right. 
as we'll see here later, it does seem to be something that he sorrows over for the rest of his life after his conversion. But you see, Paul is very much a persecutor of God's people. Right. We can go over to chapter 9. We're all familiar with this as well. But here we see the conversion of Paul, the will of salvation of Paul. And here again, once again, he is seeking to persecute God's people. In verse 1, it says, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest, and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. He was on his way to Damascus to persecute and arrest more of God's people. And so then he, as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth, and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? So if you take nothing else out of the salvation of Paul, you can know that he wasn't seeking Christ, but Christ sought him. You got it. Amen. It says, And he fell to the earth, and heard a voice saying unto him, to verse 5, And he said, who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. So here, he didn't say, The well, Lord, let me go do this or this first. Right. Like those who made excuses in the Gospels. He said, Lord, what would you have me to do? Amen. That is the mark of a true born again person. We, we can go on to verse, through verse 9. It says, And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul rose from the earth. When his eyes were open, he saw no man. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, neither did he eat nor drink. So this had a, a lasting physical effect upon Paul's will. This, Amen. The blinding light. The, yeah. I know he didn't see Christ in all his glory, but he must have saw some extent of his glory. That, that he would be blinded until Ananias would touch him and heal him. And even then, he's, we see in his le later letters that he struggled with sight. Mm -hmm. So Ananias, we go down to verse 13, Ananias was told of the Lord that Saul of Tarsus was going to come to him. That's what he says. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard of many of this man, or heard by many of this man, how much evil he had done to the saints at Jerusalem. And he, here he had authority from the chief priest to bind all that call upon thy name. Amen. And Ananias was a little skeptical, right? So he was having this man named Saul come to him, who was known throughout the area for persecuting God's people. Well, so the man Saul was not just some <laughs> some, uh, I guess you could say, average Jew of his day, but he was well known for persecuting the Christians, right? So no doubt Ananias was a little weary. So, well, he's going to come to your house, Ananias. I think any of us in our flesh would think the same thing, though. Lord, he's one of the greatest persecutors of your people, and you're going to, if you tell me he's coming to my house. Right. But the example of the Apostle Paul is, shows us what being born again really means it's a complete change. Amen. It's not just becoming a better person or being a, doing your best. It's a complete and radical change of both character and nature. We'll go over to uh, Philippians and look at how Paul describes himself before his conversion. 
Philippians in chapter number 3. I'm sure we are all familiar with these particular verses, but I'd like to look at them in a little more detail. Philippians chapter 3, we'll begin in verse number 4. He says, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he had whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. He says that he had a lot in the flesh that he could right. boast about. He could be proud about, as we would say today. And he had a lot that he could look, point to for man to say, oh, he's a great person. Right. And he begins to list these in verse 5. He says, circumcised the eighth day. This was in, in accordance with the law. Leviticus chapter 12, first three verses. Give the law of circumcision, how that when a woman brings forth a man child, she should be unclean for a certain number of days, and on the eighth day, the child is to be circumcised. Mm -hmm. And this goes all the way back to Genesis 17, verses 9 through 14, where the command is given to Abraham, all that were eight days old were to be circumcised. So, Paul, from his very beginning, was a keeper of the law, if you will, was in accordance mm -hmm. with the law. He was a very, he was very Jewish, not only in ethnicity but also in practice. Mm -hmm. You know, many of the Jews throughout history neglected the circumcision and neglected the other commandments, but yet he, even in his Infancy was in accordance with the law. Amen. Then he goes on to say, of the stock of Israel. That is, he was an Israelite. He was God's chosen and privileged people. So the Israelites really thought they were something, weren't they? Mm -hmm. Of course, John kind of cut them down a little bit and he said, well, God can, well, these stones raise up children in the neighborhood. Right. Mm -hmm. There is some advantage to the Jews. So we'll see that when we get into Romans, but we can look at a couple places real quick. Romans chapter 3. The first two verses of Romans chapter 3, after describing the Jew as one inwardly versus one outwardly, in the chapter 2, it says, What advantage then have the Jew, or what profit is there in circumcision? As much every way, chiefly because that under them were committed the oracles of God. Mm -hmm. The Jews, they were given the first words of God, the, the law, the prophets. Mm -hmm. It wasn't given to the Gentiles, but it was given to the Jews as God's people. And then we see again in chapter 9, Paul was desiring to see the salvation of Israel. He said that in verse 3 that he wished that he himself were a curse for his brethren and his kin's sake according to the kingdom and according to the flesh. Verse 4 says, Who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, who are the fathers and of whom concerning the flesh Christ came, who is over all God bless forever. Amen. Amen. The Israelites, they were the ones who were given to the law, the prophets. They had the service of God, the temple, the tabernacle. Really. Christ primarily came to them. In fact, that's what he told the one woman. They came into the lost law sheep of the house of Israel. He came first and foremost for those people. Of course, he would later turn to the Gentiles through Peter and Paul himself. But the Israelites were very blessed people mm -hmm. throughout the Old Testament up until the time of Christ. So be it of the stock of Israel was not just really anything to look over, but it was a, a privilege, especially mm -hmm. in Paul's day. Then going back to the <clears throat> First Bible, Philippians 6, says, of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. 
you know, many of the Jews at this time probably couldn't even tell exactly which tribe they were of, but mm -hmm. Paul knew he was of the tribe of Benjamin. Now, Benjamin was considered one of the preferred sons because he was a son of Rachel, along right. with Joseph. And if you recall, she died when she was giving birth to him, and Jacob called his name Benjamin. Mm -hmm. Benjamin was in an area of Judah, and when the kingdom was divided, it would be Judah and Benjamin would be the southern kingdom, and the other right. would be the northern kingdom, so that would eventually be dispersed throughout the nations. But to be a Benjaminite was a, a privileged position. If you recall Saul the king, he was a, a Benjaminite. First Samuel 9, verses 1 through 2, tell us that Saul came from the tribe of Benjamin. So here, Paul, he was, not only was he just an Israelite, he was a Benjaminite of the tribe of Benjamin. So he had right. even more privileged position, if you will, as far as his lineage goes. He says he was, when I says he was a Hebrew of Hebrews, meaning that he was, he was a full-blooded Hebrew. He wasn't mixed with others. He he could trace his lineage back all the way to Abraham, no doubt. And mm -hmm. He knew the Hebrew language. And he was what you might call the perfect or the model Hebrew. Right. So he wasn't a half breed like the Samaritans. He wasn't mixed in with Edomites and all these others, but he was. As far as the Jews were concerned, one who could really boast in his who he was genetically. He was the perfect example of what a Jew should be. Right. And he goes on to say, as touching the law, the Pharisee. And the Pharisees, especially Paul, were experts of the law. And they knew the law inside out, they knew the interpretation of the law, the observation of the law, the Traditions that went along with the law. He was part of the religious elite, if you will, of the day. In fact, Acts 23 6 tells us that even his father was a Pharisee. So. He was a Pharisee. He was raised as a Pharisee. Right. No doubt Paul knew the law as good, if not better, than most anyone of his day. Right. And to a Jew, that was a pretty big deal, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. the Pharisees, they were considered the best of the best. They were considered to the, the elite. They were, in many ways, the, the ruling class in Israel when it came to the Jewish religion. Right. And going on to verse 6, he continues on with this list of things, and he says, concerning zeal persecuting the church. That he, we, we looked at his persecuting already. He goes into a little more detail in Acts chapter 26. Turn there. Acts 26, verse 10 and 11. Here, when he was standing before Agrippa, he had given his testimony. He says in verse 10, I was going to read verse number 9. It says, I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, which thing I also did in Jerusalem, and many other saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. I punished them off in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme, and being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even in the strange cities. Here Paul says not only did he put them in prison, he testified against them even to the point where right. they were sentenced to death. He says he punished them in every synagogue and even compelled them to blaspheme. He, he tried to force them to deny the name of Christ. 
No doubt this may come in our lifetime. We get right. It. Amen. This is the type of person Paul was. That he was not just an opposer of Christians. He was a, a complete persecutor against God's people. Who, if possible, stamped out the Christian church if he could have. Mm -hmm. It goes on to even say, he, being exceedingly mad against them, he persecuted them even under strange cities. So he, persecuted them so severely that he drove them out of their own homes and other places. I will say some of that persecution probably was the, because they weren't obedient to the command of God. Called the early church was supposed to spread out and go into the whole world and preach the gospel, but they stayed at Jerusalem. And then this persecution arose and they were dispersed throughout the cities around them. But Paul was one of these that Drove them to the even strange cities. Mm -hmm. so Paul, he goes on in the next few verses to describe how he went to Damascus and his how he saw the light shine around him and the yeah, Lord talking to him. But before his conversion, he was very zealous against the people of God. Right. Christ really described this. I kind of referenced it a minute ago in John chapter 16. John 16, verse number 2. He says, They shall put you out of the synagogue. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. And these things will they do unto you, because they have not known the Father, nor me. And here he says that Christ said that one day there was coming a time when, when they kill you, they'll think they're doing God's service. And right. Exactly how Paul thought that he was really doing something for God by, as he says here in verse 9 of Acts, doing things which are contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. <coughs> He was opposing God himself and God's people, and son of God. And he really thought he was doing something for God. The key to it's found in verse 3 back in John 16, but because they have not known the Father nor me. Amen. The Jews and Paul at this time, they, they knew all about the law. They knew who God was descriptively, but they didn't know him personally. They thought they were serving God. They were at an outward service for God, but inwardly they were unchanged. Really, that's how all outward conversions go. It's, right. There's no real change of heart. There's no real change of life. It's doing what seems good to yourself. Right. <clears throat> he was really doing something for God and yet he was directly opposing God himself. Yeah. That's why Christ would speak unto him and say, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Not why persecutest thou my people, my church. Mm -hmm. But to do it unto God people was really the same as doing it unto God himself. But going back to Philippians 3, There's one more thing here to boast about in himself. He says, in the verse 6, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Mm -hmm. In his own mind, he nor any other man could find fault with him. He really was the very definition of a self righteous Pharisee. Mm -hmm. And no doubt, as far as keeping the law, he probably kept it very well. But as we'll see as we study through Romans, keeping the law in itself did not save one. Amen. Just like good works today cannot save a person, keeping the law in his day was not enough to save an individual. But Paul really thought in and of himself he was something, wasn't he? Right. He was the type that would have prayed, So Lord, I thank thee I'm not as other men are, I'm not extortioners or unjust, I give. Tithe all over this. I think they're not as, or even as this public in here. 
That's the exact type of person Paul was before the Lord saved him. And in his flesh, he could boast about all these things. But he was really the, the elite of the elite in his day, or in the Jewish religion. Mm -hmm. And yet none of that matters. We'll see in the next three verses here. He says, verse 7 through 9, But what things were gained to me, those I kind of lost for Christ. Amen. Yea, doubtless, I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dumb, that I may win Christ. Amen. And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, righteousness, which is of God by faith. And all those things don't matter in Christ, do they? Mm. I said Paul is a perfect example of real salvation, of truly being born again. He went from this self-righteous, very proud Pharisee, Jew, to now he often described himself as the chief of sinners. You know, he, as he says here, in you know himself, he was blameless for to come to the law. But when he saw himself who he really was, he saw himself as the chiefest of sinners. Right. He said all these things, they're, they're worthless. They're dumb, he calls them. They're really of no use anymore. He says it all has to be of Christ. He says in verse 9 that he <laughs> desire not to be found having his own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteous, which is of God by faith. Amen. So he said all that righteousness he had in the law, it was of no use. He, now he desires that righteousness, which only come by faith in the person of Jesus Christ. The same type of righteousness, which Abraham was described as having. So of Abraham, he believed God and it was counted for him for righteousness. He said Paul could have, you know, himself said, Yeah, Lord, I've done all this for you. He would have been just like those others who said, Apart from me, Lord, is iniquity, I never knew you. Mm -hmm. It's not all the things that we do. It's you have faith in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what makes righteousness before God. We'll see that brought out in Rome very plainly. It really doesn't matter what your background is. It matters do you know Christ to save you. Amen. So on one hand, Paul, he was everything a Jew could be, and yet none of that mattered. And on the other hand, he was a very, really a very wicked man. Even though he kept the law, but he persecuted God's people. He right. said very well known in that area of persecuting God's people. And yet, you know, the Lord could say such a one as him. So certainly no, no one today outside of the realm of possibility. Amen. So, we can see both in Apostle Paul, it doesn't matter how good of a person you are, it doesn't matter how bad of a person you are. The Lord will save those whom he will. Amen. And we also see in his conversion that there will be a radical change in one's life. Amen. And Paul didn't get saved and keep being a Pharisee, did he? But he does seem to struggle maybe with pride throughout his life, but over and over again he calls himself the chief of sinners. He regularly mentions how that he persecuted the church of God as almost he seems remorseful over that he even mm -hmm. would do such a thing. So Paul was no longer the same person that he was before the Lord saved him. Yeah. Certainly Paul is not, was not a perfect man by any means, but he certainly was a great example for us of a real, a real salvation, of a real servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
we will get a little bit of that next week, Lord willing, what it means to be a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul and his apostleship and his, his life after his conversion. And I thought about trying to teach you all one lesson, but then I realized it wouldn't be enough time. <laughs> A large portion of the book of Acts is, describes his missionary journeys and that. Besides Christ himself, Paul is probably <clears throat> one of the most influential characters in the whole of New Testament. He said he wrote more books than anyone else. He, through his ministry, more churches were established that we have record of than anybody else. Mm -hmm. And through his ministry, it spread even over into Europe and eventually over to us up in the English and Irish areas. He had eventually over to America. So Paul had a very profound effect on the gospel. We're going to look at some of that next week. We'll close with that. Amen.